Success is what everybody wants. It's a given, it's the standard. Failure, is that what we're talking about? <laughs> the absence, there should be some other word. There's success, which I would say is corporate expectations that, every, that is kind of neutered in some way. The other part of it, I think it's a life lived. I think I probably learn more from the things that don't necessarily produce results immediately. Mm -hmm. They're tougher. I mean, you have to sort of be alone with yourself and figure it out what you're trying to do. When I was right out of graduate school, I had quite a few successes right in a row. I mean, including I had a Prix de Rome, I uh, had a museum show, I won a bunch of prizes, I was in the Whitney Biennial. And I was in still my 20s, I don't think I, maybe I was 29 or 30. And you don't know what your life is going to be yet. It doesn't have a shape, right? You yeah. just, so to me, it was like, this is my life and it will always be so successful. And it was defined for some period of time in a way where it seemed as if, and this isn't bragging, this is just like sort of what happened. I, if I applied for a job, I got a job. If it seemed like I, I applied for a grant, I would get that grant. And that little golden phase lasted for, I guess, about eight or nine years. Maybe something about that. Then a lot of other things happened that coincide, like the art market in the early 90s, you know, the bottom fell out. So I didn't yet notice what was going on with my expectations versus what was happening. Um, in hindsight, it, there's a kind of trajectory that people have, or I have had, of my expectations that changes and adjusts over a period of time. And as I begin to realize that it wasn't that I felt like things weren't happening, but what went on is my gallery closed in New York City and in like maybe 93 and it was this huge relief to me. Now as I look back on that, those years were so shaping but not as important really as what has happened subsequently where I've really learned to be an artist because everybody enjoys success. We're social creatures, you know, we respond to status and our place in the tribe or in the pack. Um, it doesn't make you develop as a person. I mean, that is really just the case. When you have to struggle, and I don't mean just struggle for success in this way, like getting a show or being in an important show or selling work, I think that the criteria shifts over time where you recognize that you want to do something important or really good or that you're in competition with your younger work. Do you have any examples of of a particular problem that you went through? Well, yeah. I mean, I've been working on transitioning. I've gone back and forth my entire career between painting and three-dimensional items, sculptures. There, some are sculptures stand alone, but some are three-dimensional objects that I painted on. Oh, uh, after I stepped down from being the chair, so that was like at least four years ago, I decided I really wanted to go back to painting. and. I have been trying to figure out how to do that in the last four years. And it's been really challenging, because I know how to paint, but I just don't know what the path is for me right now that is the most important direction to take. So that's been really humbling and really interesting, and frankly, I'm really proud of myself for being so tenacious, and I'm figuring it out. What are your observations about artists making art in the current economic environment? Oh, I've thought a lot about this because I've seen things really shift. When I was uh, in graduate school, I thought of my life being from the great middle class. I thought I'd somehow stay in the middle class. But I was also really prepared you know, to be a waitress and to support myself. And I did all the classic, you know, six floor walk up, cold water flat, it's almost from the Depression era, living in Chicago, making work. And at that time, I never met anybody who had sold anything. I just, I met none of my teachers. No one talked about commerce. No one talked about success in the way that we think about it now. People talked about work. 
and how to work and how to get time to work and maybe what kind of job to get so that you could support yourself so that you could get into the mm -hmm. studio or who you want to have over or what you're doing or where you're going or what work that you've looked at it was I mean it sounds like it's such a long time ago I'm talking about 1981 um, it was a really different landscape then. I think things really shifted in the early 80s where there became a big boom in the money of the art market and I remember feeling sort of stunned that people were talking so much about success and money and that there was the correspondence between the art world and the world of celebrity. Yeah. Haven't you seen that happen? Yeah. It's really like almost the same world. But I think it's not just in the art world. I mean, you have things like, I don't know, you know, reality TV shows where people really believe that to be average, which most people by definition are, is just unacceptable. And so to live a life where you're just able to do your work and to have some successes and live the life seems like in certain definitions like that is you're, you're a loser, you're not, you're a failure. But really, what, if you accept that, you know what you're doing, you're just giving over any free will to this terribly corrupt and heartless yeah. system that is just interested in entertainment. I think that if you really look it, without a kind of hopefulness that we all buy into, we're all, we all identify with an aspirant class, not really what's happening to us, but our hopes and dreams. I think that's like what's going on in America across like all different uh, professional um, occupations as well as just you know a kind of common idea about oneself and kind of an American dream in a way we shouldn't allow ourselves to be so co-opted by this common dream when it really works against most people's lives because you know then we become outliers in this kind of way for another kind of voice of what it is that is satisfying about the occupation and I think to look at previous generations, there's much more um, there's much more conversation about what to do, what to make. I don't know if I ever told you this, but my mother was married to Mark Rothko. From what she described to me and things that I have read, most of what people were doing is getting together at the end of a painting day and talking about what they were doing, what they were painting, what were they were making and drinking a huge amount of alcohol. <laughs> of course. <laughs> so I guess for me, you know, like uh, Mark Rothko committed suicide on my 17th birthday. And if there was any sense that a certain kind of notoriety and success is going to make you happy, I would say that was an early experience that taught me that that wasn't the case at all. I read a lot of fiction and, you know, the classics that I read when I was in my late teens and early 20s and in rereading things you get to see who you were yeah. because you identify with certain characters and you get to see who you identify with now and your observations. I remember reading To the Lighthouse recently and I remember reading it when I was in my early 20s and it's about um, a character, it's this you know basically this one event in this character's life her husband is a philosopher and he's very 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 renowned and he himself realizes that he's only going to get so far and the description that Virginia Woolf uses is that he's only going to get to the letter M in the alphabet and he really thought that maybe he'd get further along he'd maybe get to Z and it's not going to happen so when I was young, I really identified with that character and his ambition and the need to get to the end of the alphabet. And in this book, there's another character, and she's almost like a hobbyist painter. She's just trying to, I think her name is Lily Bart, I'm not exactly sure. She's kind of a minor character, but the book closes with her trying to paint something. And she's trying to paint a little piece of light that's on a stair in front of a doorway. It's such a beautiful poetic moment to end the book. When I was young, I never even noticed this character, and I certainly wouldn't identify with her. And now to me, the authenticity of trying to get something, to capture something in this moment that we're living in, is really deeply profound to me. I think the problem with thinking about success and failure is that you think that success fortifies you against feeling yeah and it doesn't because it makes you 
impermeable. That's what one thinks. And I learned something a long time ago, well not a long, long time ago, but in recent history, where I said to somebody, I want things like to be better, I want my work to be better or something, you know, I want it to be perfect. And then this person asked me, well, what would perfect mean? Well, I'd have this gallery and I'd make this money and I'd do this and this and this. And he said, so if something is perfect, it's like a death wish. That was, I felt that was like profound. Like a death wish, I, I didn't get it. And he said, well, only when you're dead do you not have to do anything. When something's perfect, you don't have to do anything. But in every other situation, you have to continue to function and to feel and to navigate what those feelings are, which are complicated. And I just think to accept that, that's not accepting failure. It's just not letting success dictate in this pretty heartless way what it is, that, in a pretty bureaucratic way, how you should be measured.